Good morning. Welcome to Worship Day. We're glad that you're here. If you're visiting with us, you'll find in the pew rack a guest card. If you would complete that guest card and leave it in an offering plate in the back, it'll give us a way to be in touch with you and share more about the life of our church. You'll also notice in your bulletin today new information about our giving portal. This allows you to give digitally. We've been doing this for a while. We just changed um, our platform for doing that. So you'll see that in the bulletin this morning. And there's a printed letter sitting in th at the back near where you got your bulletin. They'll explain more. If you're interested in knowing more information how to do that, there's that letter at the back you want to pick up today. In your bulletin today is a nice update from the Board of World Mission. It's giving you information about um, outreach and help that's going towards Ukrainian refugees and also information about the recent flooding in Honduras and how you might be uh, able to assist those who are trying to recover in both of those situations. I want you to be aware that uh, our, uh, we are in the midst of a COVID spike in Surrey County is one of a handful of tried counties that are now in the red zone or or high impact zones, so be careful. Uh, last week, the risk assessment for 25 people in a room um, was about 27%. This week, it's 41%. And I've tracked over the last couple weeks more people, about 10 people in our congregation, who have uh, contracted COVID. This particular strain is fairly mild for the fully vaccinated and boosted. It's still serious, and it is as contagious as measles. That was the word from our personal physician. So be careful. With that in mind, we have postponed that intergenerational event we hoped to have held this coming Saturday. We'll do it later in the fall when the risk level is far lower, more like 5%. As we continue in worship today, today I'm going to share with you about the third stage of this journey towards an ever deeper relationship with God and spiritual growth and the theme of perplexity. And I share with you this morning uh, the passage that was given to me for my confirmation when I was young, Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 17. Seek God where God is found. Let us stand as we sing together hymn 778.
join me in a time of prayer. And as we go to prayer, I share with you words from a, a wonderful song by John Guerrero, Kingdom of God. Oh, that I could see your face, O oh Lord. How I'm longing for that day, brighter sun of holy grace, make my heart a holy place. Blessed are the poor who have nothing to own. Blessed are the mourners who are crying alone. Blessed are the guilty who have nowhere to go. For, theirs, for their hearts have a road to the kingdom of God, and their souls are the songs of the kingdom of God. And they will find a refuge, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Lord, as we gather in Your presence today, we come and we bring with us all that we've experienced, our joys, our hopes, as well as our sorrows, our fears, and our doubts. We come because we know we are able to turn to You and we are grateful for the many ways that You've provided for us in this week. And as we look at the week that's coming, we know that there'll be opportunities to love and serve You and give our love to others. But there's many challenges that also we face. So we've come in hopes that we find in Your presence today everything we need, in hopes that the worship we bring to You would honor You, and most importantly, that we can meet You here in this space. So we lay aside those burdens, we give them to You. Be with us, Lord, in these moments we pray. For it's in the name of Jesus we ask. Amen. We turn to Scripture this morning that we may find the Word of God for us there. This morning we'll go to the 6th chapter of Ephesians, verses 10 to 17, where we find these words of encouragement. Finally, be strengthened by the Lord and His powerful strength. Put on God's armor so that you can make a stand against the tricks of the devil. We aren't fighting against human enemies but against rulers, authorities, forces of cosmic darkness, and spiritual powers of evil in the heavens. Therefore, pick up the full armor of God so that you can stand your ground on the evil day, and after you have done everything possible, to stand still. So stand with the belt of truth around your waist, justice as your breastplate, and put shoes on your feet so that you are ready to spread the good news of peace. Above all, carry the shield of faith so that you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the, war and the sword of the Spirit, which is God's Word. Word of God for the people of God. Thank you.
Gracious God, bless this offering. May we be able to use it to bless others. Bless those who gave of their hearts, and may you bless many because they did. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Are there any children? Yeah, we do have somebody. You get one-on-one -on -one treatment today. The best kind. The board has asked me to share in this moment of worship in these last couple Sundays with you things that they've been working on, and their biggest project has been to move to one board. So I thought I'd give you a little bit of background about what that's about. So serving Grace Moravia and then later getting an opportunity to serve Christ Moravia, and I served Christ for nine years, and combined I've now served a church for ten years, which is you. What you might not know is that in the 90s, we met as a joint board on the same night, and we'd get a lot of things done, and then we would go into our separate meetings, and that just made so much sense. When I was at Christ Moravian, we did the same thing, and it started to make sense to be one board, and they went through a long process like we have to live into it to make sure that's what we needed to do, and Christ is one of the churches in our province that has one board. The other story is around 2006, I was part of a team that began to look at ways that our province could work more efficiently, and so we went out and visited different churches, and the thing that popped out at me is the churches, small and big, who are thriving, who are doing really well, tend to have one board. So upon my return, we started talking about it. We've been working on it, particularly since 2018, but it was the fall of 2019 when we started digging deep and doing some research. So the research on this is a man named Dan Hotchkiss. You can find uh, his book on Amazon. It's entitled Governance and Ministry. What makes him unique is his career was with the Alban Institute. And that's an institute that helps churches just do better governance, better ministry, better just about everything. And over the course of his career, he worked with 14 different denominations and a lot of not-for-profits like the YMCA, church camps, groups like that. And without fail, he said, the groups that work the most efficient have one board. Now, if you want to go to Raleigh or you want to go to, uh, to our uh, Congress in Washington, D.C., yes, there's a House of Representatives and there's the Senators. And let them do the two-board system. You see how good it works, right? It doesn't work in churches and not-for-profits. And those who have learned how to be one board are far more efficient for the main reason is when something really big and catastrophic like COVID hits, you can think and decide and discuss and work together far more quickly and responsibly. Thank the Lord that we've been working on this for two years and then COVID hit and we were ready. In fact, we didn't lose a beat. Uh, having to move to virtual meetings and meeting together and sometimes more often than once a month, it, it just proved itself that uh, we have been deciding together. So even though you've been electing trustees and electing elders for four years, for all intents and purposes, they've been one board and decided everything together. So what they're hoping to do this fall is to more formally adopt that, and there's a whole process for that, and they'll work through that later. The thing I want to leave you with, and I'll say more about this in the next couple Sundays, is what Dan Hotchkiss noticed. The organizations that do ministry the best think, and, you know, instead of having trustees and elders, think of governance. That's the board doing what they do to keep things organized, keeping our finances organized, our membership care organized, our policies organized, and other matters that might come up. But the other group is what we call ministry teams. You've heard me speak about that a lot, and we'll say more in the next two Sundays. Because church needs to be a place that's not about you joining a membership, and, and yes, there's things you should expect because you're a member of this church, but it gets even more wonderful when you realize this is a place that wants to equip you to minister to this community. In fact, here's an uh, ironclad promise I'll make you. When you're on a ministry team, especially one that serves the community, you will find everything you need. It's just interesting how that works. It's the heart and soul of what Jesus taught his disciples. 
When you come and follow me, he said, and you serve others, you will find everything you need. Seek first the kingdom of God, and everything else follows. May we continue to ponder that as we stand and sing our next hymn together. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our hearts with your presence. Help us to set aside whatever would distract us so we can focus on you and hear from this text from Ephesians 6 what you want us to hear and how you want us to live. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Perplexity is described in the dictionary, in Merriam-Webster's dictionary, as a state of bewilderment or entanglement. I've been asking, uh, Phyllis has been working with me to make a new stole for the wedding that's going to happen for Nathan in Denver in September, and I'm almost done with it, and you've done a great job. And I think when I'm talking to a couple about getting married, all of you who have been married, it's perplexing, isn't it? But when you hear that word, you know, our mind goes to the negative, but I want you to hear it's also, there's some positive there. Perplexity also opens up the opportunity for curiosity, to discover many things. If anything I've learned from being married 35 years is, I'm not going to make my partner the way I want that partner to be, and my partner's not going to make me the way she wants me to be that we've got to accept each other as we are, and the more we do that, it's just like I keep discovering this awesome person in myself and in Beverly. That's perplexity and it's beauty. So we've been discussing these stages of spiritual development that happen throughout our life. They happen over and over again, whether we're spiritually a, an infant or a child or a teenager or a young adult or middle adult or adult, spiritually speaking, we're going to go back and forth between simplicity and complexity and perplexity to harmony. And our big tendency, particularly when we're teaching the young, is to make everything jump from simple to harmony. And it's okay. We don't want the people we love to hurt. And when we start talking about complexity, and especially perplexity, we're talking about pain and the lessons that come through the things that are hard. When I think about um, life and, and what I've discovered about it, one of the things I've learned is when you think about the simple, you're thinking about when we're little and we're either infants or children, things need to be black and white and there's rules and we look up to our leaders and 
our parents, our grandparents, our teachers, they teach us, all that has its place. And when we get to complexes, when we're starting to make our own decisions a little bit, we're starting to explore life, we're learning from our mistakes, but we're also learning from our successes, and we kind of get confidence, we're ready to go do it. Uh, somebody recently who's a John Wayne fan gave me a collection uh, on a DVD of a lot of John Wayne movies, those spaghetti westerns that he made in his early career. They're all so fun to watch, right? Because the plot's simple, and the good guys win, and wouldn't life be great if it was just that way? But it's not. It's complex. And yet the complexity makes us want to strap it on like John Wayne and go win for the good guys. Perplexity is when we really start to dive in and learn. One writer describes it this way. The naive certainty of simplicity meets the can-do confidence of complexity, but, but then we get to learn deeply. And he's, he's talking specifically of those of us who went to seminary or, or education beyond college. In the third stage, we discover the treasures and gifts that come from honesty, humility, openness, curiosity, scholarship, and a commitment to understand the truth no matter the cost. One writer said, uh, was describing specifically seminarians. I was thinking of a really good friend of mine who's exactly my age who starts seminary this fall. And I met her through pilgrimage, and in fact, we were having a training meeting here at the church earlier in the spring, and she was in a flux and trying to figure out what's next in her life, and I said, it's not like you need to go to seminary. Seminary is not just for the training of church professionals, but people with these deep spiritual questions. And, but I have to tell you, you're going to go and they're going to really challenge you because you're going to kind of find that you're having issues with sort of faith stuff that you've learned that's good and you've sort of adopted it from other people, but you're trying to put your own together and you're struggling with it. But let me warn you, because you're going to go from construction to deconstruction to reconstruction, it's going to feel like you're living through Holy Week over the course of three years. But when you come out the other end, watch out. You are being prepared for something wonderful. And, and she did apply to Wake Divinity School, and she starts this fall, and I'm excited for her. But when I think about that statement, I think about when you're talking to seminary students and they learn all this stuff, they, get into, they find themselves in their own perplexity. Man, I learned all this stuff I didn't learn in Sunday school, but if I go tell anybody at church the stuff I'm learning, they'll probably run me out of town. Robert and I have talked about that a lot. Perplexity is that level of spiritual learning where you get to things that have multiple answers, not just one where uh, you're willing to show up and somebody's suffering and you don't have answers for them, but because you're there, you actually learn something from their suffering and they learn from you. And it, it, it's one of those things, again, that I don't understand everything I know about that. Which brings me to another thing I want you to really uh, uh, take in deeply. There's things we do understand with our mind and basic learning, but there's so much we understand with our heart and with our actions. And this is why I picked today this particular scripture um, to share with you. I grew up in a church where the stained glass window, instead of being there, is behind the pulpit. And it's, it illustrates that great passage from Isaiah that says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. In a, in a similar passage from Isaiah that says, When you seek me, you will find me. It's a beautiful anthem that gets sung a lot in the Moravian church. I love that anthem. So I remember when I was kind of moving, you know, somewhere in my young adult teenage years, it's kind of all mushed together. I, I remember looking at that one Sunday and thinking, wait a minute, I thought God's always here. That's what they taught us in Sunday school. What's this business about when he's near? I mean, is there a time when he's not? Is that what it's saying? My mind was just spinning all those snarky questions that teenagers and young adults like to ask. I was 17 years old. I was in the choir. And that, at Freeze Memorial, the, there's a choir loft, so you kind of get the, the cheap seats in the back, and you can fall asleep if you want to because they can't see you. I'm, I'm not, not that you're going to fall asleep, David. Um, and then somebody very special passed away. It would be equivalent to you, Jim Littleton, Fred Crater, he was the guy that would pass out the gum for the young ones coming in, and 
he did so much in the church that it was only at his funeral that I realized he did like a million things and I was only aware of maybe five. And the whole church grieved. He had something to do with the hanging of the greens back when we actually hung real greens and that was all okay with the fire department. So there was a real big event where there would be oyster stew and the hanging of the greens. And, and Fred had a lot to do with that. I did, not, I did not know that part. And he had a catastrophic heart attack on the way home from the hanging of the greens. And he did not survive. So there we just hung the greens. It was a Friday night, I think, and Sunday afternoon we're having his funeral. And I remember the choir standing up and we're going to sing 10,000 times 10,000. And boy, we're just going to sing it out. I was in my John Wayne. You know, we're going to sing this out. And suddenly the words of that hymn made perfect sense, like crystal clear, and we cried. That's perplexity in a good way. You see, perplexity is that part of your spiritual journey you're not going to get to in a book. You're not going to get to it in a class. They can help you get there. You're going to get to it by living your faith. You're going to get to it by loving people who are living their faith, and then the Lord's going to take them out of your life, and it's going to hurt. But the hurt's going to open you to something deeper. That's where perplexity opens the door. The thing I've learned as a pastor, particularly in, say, the last 10 years, and I learned this from a friend that I became his pastor, and just before I did, and we were we've become brothers in many ways, his wife suddenly passed away. And I learned only later that she was the babysitter for my sister and my brother and I, Ann Haskins. And what I learned from him, he was so depressed at that loss. He was overwhelmed. He could not grieve alone. He needed help. What I learned from him is something very powerful. As you do move spiritually, and I hope you choose to because you can choose to stay stuck if you want to be. If you want to be studied in your spirituality, go for it. You, can get to, you get to do that. But if you really want to grow up into a spiritual adult, you're going to have to move from being a baby to a child to a teenager to a young adult to a middle adult to an older adult, spiritually speaking. And every time you move up through those steps, you're going to go through Holy Week. You're going to go through experiences that feel like being betrayed. It's not that necessarily that somebody betrayed you, but the beliefs that you've known to this point in your life are not going to fit the new challenges that you face. And so it's going to feel as if they betrayed you, as if you've been hung up to die, as if you've been buried, but then there's a resurrection every single time. When Fred died, it hurt. But because perplexity took me through that to some degree, I began to see something deeper. That was the first of a whole slew of losses, three losses in, in our extended family in about a 30-month period of time. When I came out the other end, I felt like somebody who had lived through dog years. You know what I'm saying? You know, dogs live seven years to every one of ours. So it wasn't 30 months had passed. It felt like a decade had passed in my soul. And I, if you spoke to me at that point, I wasn't going to tell you much about grieving. What I was going to tell you about is this awesome love I was beginning to understand. The love of Christ that's beyond explanation, that's found most in perplexity. Where do you seek the Lord? In perplexing places. So how did I get to learn all of that? Where, where, what took me to those places of discovery? I learned it from showing up in other people's perplexity, and I get to do that as a pastor. I want to take you, take you to Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 17 for a moment. Uh, it's not the brightest and the best. It is a great promise of hope. It's kind of scary because it mentions some things that are very scary and very true. And this was the passage that John Beefus gave me on my confirmation. And he knew that I was, I was sensing a sense of call at a very young age, and, and I kind of wondered why he, he picked this passage. It's also the passage that so, shows up on a pilgrimage weekend right before we talk about the things we do that become obstacles to God's grace in our life. So I've got, I get to hear this every time I do a weekend. I've been on a team about 15 times now. I've given the talk that goes with this one about a half a dozen times. And every time I'm standing waiting for the moment to give this talk, listening to the Scripture read, I remember being confirmed by John Beefus. 
I wonder what he was trying to tell me. I'd like to think he was, he was telling me, if you're going to be a pastor above all, you better get ready for perplexity. It's going to be really, really hard. You're going to need all the good stuff in this passage. But more than anything, just be with people and be with them in God's love. You don't have to be a pastor to do that. So real simply, I want you to notice a couple things, and I'm putting on my perplexity thinking hat to do this. Um, what do you notice in that first verse? Where does the strength, where does your strength come from? The strength that we need to do anything does not come from you. It does not come from me. It don't come from anybody you know and love. You know where it comes from? The Lord. The Lord brings the strength. So no matter how dark the challenge is and how scary it is, and it might seem like the worst possible episode of Stranger Things or something like that, like it's going to get really, really scary, notice what Paul said in Ephesians, your strength will come from the Lord. Therefore, put on this armament that He's provided. As I was thinking about that this week, I also was thinking about um, part of what he's describing is adversity that's not just evil things. Sometimes that adversity is the consequences that we have with each other when we choose not to love, when we choose to compete or stand against each other, or we just make mistakes that we didn't intend. I mean, let's face it, our human nature has this self-centered gravity to it. We're always drawn to the things we want and not what God wants for us. All that energy stuff that's in conflict with each other, that's what he's talking about. That's what he means by that list of principalities and powers and all of that. So look at the armor. The belt of truth, which is found in perplexity. The breastplate of justice, which is found in perplexity. The shoes that come from the willingness to spread the good news of Jesus, to go into those hard places the shield of faith. And whenever you see faith in the New Testament, the actual word is trust. To trust God, even though you're walking into a dark place. That helmet of salvation. Remember, salvation is to seek at the same time the best possible relationship with God, myself, with my neighbor, and my environment. It's not just me and God. I can't claim to be in right relationship with God and be judging my brothers and sisters. And finally, the sword And the word there is logos. The word there is Jesus. I believe in the infallible word of God and it has a name and his name is Jesus. Jesus. This is all about relationship. The place where I learned to take all this and learn about perplexity and do it in an Ephesians 6, 10-17 kind of way happened just a few years ago. In the middle of my time at King, I was invited in the course of a summer into the lives of three different people. One had been uh, somebody I knew about 10 years before at a church I served very briefly. She was an infant at the time I did her baptism, and now she had a life-threatening illness. She was 11 years old, and she passed. But the pastor who was serving her was just out of seminary, and we're friends, and I got involved, and we did some guitar things in her room at Brenner's Children's Hospital because she had a brain injury. And I watched him do the ministry. I was just showing up to kind of tag team from time to time. But I noticed when you step out of the usual, when you when you get to be the outsider, you don't you have nothing to lose, but take Jesus love to somebody, that's the best place to go. It's like a mission trip. You're going to be there for a short period of time. If you mess it up, it's not going to be the end of the world, but if you get it right, you might actually learn something you're going to need for something that does matter in your life. She was one, somebody I knew in in the life of the King Moravian Church was one, and then somebody I had known at Christ Moravian. Uh, In this case, the fellow had had a catastrophic stroke, and he was going to pass, and his wife was not ready for that, and everybody was trying to help the wife deal with this. Nobody could do it, so the pastor called me, He said, Neil, you know her so well, if you just go tell her the truth, she might hear you. It's the first time I ever said, stop expecting God to show up. Expect God to show off. But it's going to be small, and it's going to be inconsequential, and it might be the person that mops his room in the ICU unit at Forsyth Hospital. Or the person who brings the flowers, the person who brings the food, whatever. I'll never forget three days later, they're at Kate B. Reynolds, and he's dying, and they're having a party. And I'm wondering, what in the world did, did I create here? This is messed up. 
And I'll never forget what Lynn said. I see it now. I was being selfish. I wanted him to stay. And God is getting ready to take him, and we're celebrating the life we've had with him. Talking about perplexity flipped upside down into something beautiful. So those of you I've traveled with, you probably are sick and tired of me saying, stop expecting God to show up. Expect Him to show up, but you know what I mean. So let me say to those of you who have let me do that over the course of 25 years at different points in time, thank you because you've made me who I am. Invited me into your perplexity, taught me something that I've been able to teach others. Oh, by the way, that summer of 2014 with those three families, that was pretty awesome. I had no idea the following, the following summer would be so hard when I was in the depths of great perplexity with uh, a loss in our family. And I was ready because I chose to show up when it wasn't so hard. Hear what I'm saying. God will invite you to show up in somebody's perplexity when it's not that hard to do so. And if, you get, if you're too busy to notice, you're going to regret it. But if you'll show up, you'll find some things. So when later it's your perplexity and it's really hard, you'll have better eyes to see. Really, it's not going to be a knowledge thing. It's going to be a humility thing. You're going to be, have a better ability to get over yourself and let others in to help. Don't let anybody tell you God will never give you something you can't handle. That is not true. God's going to give you big stuff to handle, and the only way to handle it is to let others handle it with you. Because He's working through them too. When we think about this, something I want you to think about is Holy Week. So I want you to think about Jesus for a second and, and how He is portrayed during Holy Week. I want you to start with Thursday at the Last Supper and all the stuff that went down there. Uh, what do you notice about how Jesus acted? Did he get mad? Did he fly off the handle? Did he leave the room and go sulk somewhere? He just kind of just kept going through it, right? Gospel of John, he said some of the most important things he ever said that night. But there's that still calm presence. I think about another passage from Isaiah as a sheep before the shearer is dumb, so he was silent in the presence of those who came to hurt him. And it ends up in a trial, and then he's on the cross, and it looks terrible, and he suffered all of that. And we go back and look at Ephesians 6, 10-17, and every piece of armor shows up in Holy Week with Jesus. But notice what Jesus didn't do. He did not try to resist. He did not try to fight back. He did not try to take control of the situation. He just kept being love incarnate, even though we killed him. And when he rose from the dead, he brought with him all of that armor and then some. The power to overcome fear and doubt and hate and anger and all of our sin. The power to show what love unleashed can do to the world. And he kept taking them back to that, that same supper table from Thursday night over and over again. I think that's what he means when he says, when you do this in remembrance of me, you do this for me. When you do this love and remembrance of me, you bring my love to life in a deeper way, in yourself and in others. Last thing I want to say about perplexity was an, an interesting uh, part of my own journey. So after I left you to go to Fairview, they didn't last very long. So I get the privilege of coming and helping churches to kind of revitalize themselves. I've gotten to do it with you twice. And some of the places I've gone to help a church be revitalized, it didn't go well. Ask my sons or Beverly, they'll, they'll probably have more uh, colorful words um, for what that was like. And so I took a break for a while and I got to teach at Salem College full time for a year and then for the following five years as an adjunct uh, professor in New Testament and Moravian studies, and I learned a ton. I mean, I learned a lot being a teacher. It's true, teachers learn more than the students. I fell in love with the New Testament, with the Old Testament, and certain parts of Scripture, particularly the Gospels, because I was teaching it all the time. But I got called into the, uh, the office one day. Yeah, the preacher gets called to the office sometimes. I got called to the office of the chairman of the Ridge Department, and very graciously says, Neil, You've got to be a teacher, not a pastor. 
And then he explained using a, a Hopi Indian analogy. He says, you know, Hopi Indians, when the children are kind of going through their confirmation thing, the deal is, is that they have to first understand all this wonderful spiritual heritage they've inherited. It's good stuff. And all the religious heritage that you've gained as a member of this church or a member of the Christian faith is really good stuff, but it comes from your parents, your grandparents, your Sunday school teachers. It's all good, but you've inherited it. And the goal is to get to the place where you own it and you're able to teach it and extend it to others. But in between is a deep chasm. Some call it construction, deconstruction, reconstruction, or you're oriented, things make sense as you, you're growing up from a child to a teenager and stuff will happen, usually death or divorce or losing a job or, or just really difficult things and cause great perplexity in your life. And it feels as if your faith is shattered. And it's when you put it back together and you come out the other side that you really have something because you've had to live your faith through to difficult things. And then he said, Neil, stop trying to be the bridge to get those kids from oriented faith to their own faith. Allow them to go through the chasm of what they're struggling with. Boy, that was great wisdom. And I took it to the church. And I've tried to do that faithfully with many of you. Where are you in that passage? Are you still back at the beginning, just kind of playing around with the things you've inherited? It's wonderful. I think about a Christmas tree and the old ornaments that have always been there. Are you trying to get to the other side? I hope we all are, to that wonderful place of faith where you've owned it and you're ready to share it. Have you skipped over the part in the middle that's hard? Two pieces of advice. Stop skipping over it and let others be in it with you. Sometimes you're the teacher, many times you're the student, but if you'll travel through the hard places together and embrace this perplexity, we will end up in harmony. May God continue to teach you this truth. Speaking of which, as we go to prayer today, we want to remember particularly Bill Needham, Jane Needham's husband. Uh, he has been in declining health for a considerable period of time, and it's taken a hard turn, and Jane is asking for our prayers for Bill. Let's join as we pray together for others on our prayer list today. O oh, gracious God, who is able to do all things, who is the great physician, the creator, redeemer, sustainer, we pray your blessing on all those who we continue to pray for by name and those we hold in the privacy of our hearts. For Jane and Bill Needham, for Granville Sidner, Juanita Rogers, for Frank Greenwood and Bernie Epperson, for Tommy Pendleton, for John Holt, for Charlie Hall and Ed O'Connor, Lavinia McMillan, Betty Epperson, Susan Hyatt, and Polly Holder, for Ian Harrell, for Jacob Brown, for Everett Tolbert, for Linda Novak and Doris Scott, for Robbie Nations and Eddie Weevil, Shelby Hunter and Marlon Mabe, Dale Barker and Fred Yates, for Sam Moser, for Sam Smith, for Danny Strauss and Susan Strauss. And again, for all those we hold in the privacy of our heart. Be with them all, we pray, Lord, for it's in your name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand and allow this last hymn to really be your, your guidepost for this week. Hymn number 590, Though I May Speak with Bravest Fire.
you go into this week, allow the grace of God, the presence of God, the love of God to guide you, to see through the perplexity you may find yourself in. Even more to see those around you who may be struggling in their perplexity. Not to fix it, not to change it, but to be their companion in the journey. That's how we discover what God truly wants for all of us. In Jesus' name, amen.